thanks ever so much for joining me today. Um, it's a, a real privilege of mine because um, I've followed you over the years. But um, your first single, um, Not So Manic, was a cover version. How, how did that sort of come about? Oh, right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, just, just to be absolutely 100%, um, yeah, it was actually the, the third single, but it was the first one that most people knew about oh. because we did Stars and anywhere first but there was kind of just grazed the lower of nether regions of the top 40 and then not so manic now it, it wasn't so much of a, a a cover as a cut because people you know the song wasn't really um properly released as such it was on a demo tape which we got uh it was handed to us like a year or two before in a nightclub they were like a you know a small band brick called brick supply mm. and um we listened to the song, liked the song a lot, and incorporated it into our set. Um, and then that was on one of the ori original flushes of tapes, which went out to the record labels in 1994, maybe the end of three, nine, early 94. And because um, it had become a part of our set, it kind of, it just st stuck. But also it's, it seemed to um, say something about us that we hadn't managed to do in a self-penned song yet. It, 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 in, in, a, in some ways it still kind of captures the ethos of what uh, the group was about back then probably better than anything which we had it seemed to crystallize things for people so so yeah and it's uh, it's as i usually say it's a bit like um our version of well it's our don't you forget about me in terms of like simple minds yeah people you know like if you don't know simple minds you still know that song and yeah. if you don't know dub star you probably know not so manic now um, so yeah, it helped, didn't it? Yeah, Simple Minds didn't write, don't you forget about me. Either. Yeah, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's what I mean, but like, it's kind of a, you know, it's inextricably linked to them, and, and not many people really think about the authorship issue with them. No, they don't know. <laughs> didn't, didn't, I thought one of um, um, Simple Minds fans wrote that, didn't they? I, I, I'm not 100% sure, I think, um, and I, I I mean, I list, I've heard the original demo of that song because mm. it was somewhere on an online magazine, and it was remarkably similar to the Simple Minds version. It's like they've, they've, they've it, it could have been one of their friends, you know. And apparently, it was written knowingly that it was probably, gonna, hopefully, going to be Simple yeah. Minds doing it. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't know any more than that. But it is remarkably like the one, the one that we know. And um, whereas, by contrast, <laughs> our Ooh. version of. Uh, not so like now is quite markedly different to um mm. to the original version <laughs> so so your first album disgraceful yeah <laughs> one word review <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, it's you you were caught into like the mid 90s with the brit pop sort of scene but would you say yourselves were part of that scene it, we kind of straddled it um, quite uncomfortably, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we, we we were signed to the re we were signed to Blur's record label at the height of like Blur's when when Blur just sort of bashed through into the charts. But yeah. Blur, it's the label that they were on, rather yeah. than their label on. Sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> but uh, so so Food Records was 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 the label of. Uh, blur, but it was also the level of shampoo. So we thought somewhere between those two things, maybe we we would fit yeah. in. Yeah, and at the time, you know, like uh, Andy uh, Andy Ross from Food, he, um, you know, everybody expected him to just keep riding the brick pop gravy train. But since he already had one of the two, you know, heavyweights, um, he, it was kind of uh, to his credit that he he didn't really just keep uh, plowing that furrow. He, he want because um, for instance, you know, he turned down menswear and, and, and people like that. Um, but he, I think he, he liked uh, he liked the idea of signing uh, bands which one weren't from London this time, and two <laughs> were not going to be like the sort of thing that everybody else was trying to sign. He, he liked the idea of coming in from the left field, and um, and he, you know, it's, which is great because I mean we had we had the benefit of being on the label the blue was on and all of and you know which was obviously a subsidiary of AMI as well so that the checks were underwritten by AMI so we had an awful lot of um, firepower even though we were rank outsiders you know yeah. in terms of you know where we were coming from musically. So because then you know um, the beggars were doing the Newman album um, Random. Yeah. 
um, biggest banquet, I believe that was then. Um, yeah, it was. So, so you, did you pick Every Day I Die or was that something you were asked to record or? I, I remember we, we, we thought about doing, you know, one of the more obvious ones, like our friends electric or cars or something, but it was seemed clear that we, we weren't sure what, what order we'd arrived at the party at. I didn't know how, who had done what yet, but you could be pretty assured that there was already going to be a bit of a fight over who was going to do those songs. You know, I mean, for me personally, the, the Tube Army period, I find most exciting in Gary's uh, songbook. Um, and... You know that 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 song was you know even for even for that album the first album is not an obvious choice to, to cover but the, the lyrics is so interesting and um, you could say that <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, uh, Sarah you done you done a brilliant job on the on the vocals oh thanks um, in fact I was listening to it yesterday as well um, it's really good I mean obviously you were aware of of what the song is about. Gary, I, I, I had a, a, an experience where I, I, I met Gary and he was, he was at great pains to make sure that I knew exactly what I was singing about. <laughs> he was so sweet. He was like some sort of kindly uncle. He was like, you, you do know the, the true meaning of the song, don't you? I'm like, yes, yes. And he's like, and you're fine with it. I'm like, absolutely fine with it. So I thought that was that very sweet to him. Yeah, the, 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 that, that um, random album, it, it, that really kind of started a, attended a relationship between us and Gary, um, because I think the, the first the first time I met G Gary was at the Depeche Mode party for the release of the Ultra album, which was earlier in 1997, and I think I think Random came out around spring summer, and um, and I, and I was at, we at the party for the Depeche Mode release, and Gary was at his own at the bar. Um, and you don't often find Gary at a bar because he's not. He doesn't. He doesn't really drink at all. Mm. But um. But he was. He was on his own, and I. I kind of thought it, would be, it seemed like a good opportunity to, to meet Gary Newman. You know, because you know, it, he loomed large in my childhood, you know, um, yeah, yeah. thoughts. You know, and so so I introduced myself. I mentioned that I was in Dubstar, and and he and he already had, you know this the album wasn't there, but he was already familiar with our version of that song. Mm. And he and he, he he was very enthusiastic about it, and and a lot more affable and you know and friendly than I really expected from somebody who on TV always seemed so remote and kind of almost like like a, you know a Mac uh, man, yeah. <laughs> you know, like so I was um you know I was I found that quite disarming, and 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 he started to be very free flowing with chat about about his lyrics and especially from that period of time mm. um you know where it's, it's a lot of it's very dystopian uh, you know a lot of transhumanism and but also with these sort of seedy underbelly of uh, anatomical stuff and you know the, the some of the things that he told me that it, <laughs> that evening were extraordinary when it, and it seems obvious now when i revisit those records but mm. you know in particular uh, my love is a liquid um, i won't repeat exactly what he said because it was just it's too far out <laughs> but uh, it was like I, you know I, you can't unhear that once <laughs> when yeah. you revisit the song after that you know um, so but um a few years later you actually did work with gary on um or was it just sarah or was it the, both of you i can't quite remember now well, no, it was, uh, I mean, Sarah, funnily enough, uh, she obviously gets to sing with Gary because it was a, a duet, mm. um, but uh, she she didn't come to the recording session. Um, and I forget why, uh, but... I don't remember why. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it was the 90s, so you, she was probably busy, had been given a job to do somewhere else for some, you know. Mm. But uh, myself and Steve uh, Hillier, the original programmer in Dubstar, we went in the car to Essex um, to, and visited Gary's home, um, which was close to Stansted Airport. He'd, mm. he'd been there a long time since the 80s, I think. And I believe he only uh, left that house because of Stansted's expansion forced him to, <laughs> to you know, I they, they bought done, him out. He'd he done well out of it because he got a compulsive yeah. order on it. So. Right, yeah, what? yeah. But, wow. but I, I think he wasn't down to go. And, and then um, and it was, you know, it was a fascinating day. I spent a whole day with him. And, and in actual fact, it was recorded in a, a kind of a, a house, a small sort of outhouse on the grounds of it, you know, of his home, mm. which he and his father had, had built together, apparently, probably a while before. You know, and he gave us, he gave us the big tour of the, the inside and... I mean, I, there was moments where I was kind of trying to pinch myself, but the, the, the uh, when we actually did the recording, um, 
it was quite slightly traumatic because he uh, the closer we got to the point where we wanted to actually record it Gary was kind of visibly getting nervous about this it was a quite an unusual situation for him actually and, and, it, and I started to realize what a big ask it was you know because it wasn't a song that he'd written and um and he wasn't you know he didn't know if he was going to deliver it right I mean when we had this when we took the song you know we we picture it in our minds what it'll sound like in this section with Gary on it and um we, when we went to go and do it, he wanted to do a few run-throughs, and and myself and Steve had we had both about operating different DAT machines because we wanted to have a safety copy because we were worried that we, you know, we, we might get it all the way there and back back to, back to yeah. London, and and we, you know we haven't got it, so we we press you know we weren't pressing record, but he was listening through and he's, he he was singing, but he, he was kind of mumbling and he sat and he looked concerned and it wasn't quite coming out and I had this sinking feeling that this was just wasn't going to work and we were going to have to record whatever we got go back home and you know make exchange pleasantries and and you know anyway they decided they said look let's, let's just go for a, a take so we both pressed record and, and then suddenly just like came to life like, and it was you know like Gary Newman you know yeah. it was and, and I actually, because I was listening to him, you know, in the room, like probably about a metre from him, his physicality. Mm. Um, so that I, I'm not listening to the effects he's got in his plans and stuff. And, and, it, and it really just, I could feel the hair go up on the back of my arms because, you know, if you told me when I was seven years old that this yeah. would be in that situation, I would be absolutely astonished, you know. Um, so, and it, and it, realized, it occurred to me later that it, this is something that's similar about Sarah as well. Um, I think it's partly because he, he maybe didn't like the concept of, of rehearsing and, and it's because it's quite phony. And mm. I think when he's actually performing, it's not really an act. It's, you know it's what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It, that's, it's like, yeah it's that, that, that's when you're yourself. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So um, I, I would just rather, far, far rather just listen and listen and listen and listen. And then when I sing, it's like, this is it. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is, you know, this, this yeah. is the one. And that's how I approach Everything. So anyway, it was a, it was a fascinating day. But it was a long day, considering the actual recording was quite small. I mean, we had two meals with him. I had lunch and dinner, and he had the same thing both times. I should say, Gary. I don't know if he still does this, but at the time he would only eat sausage and chips, and that was it. Yeah. And, and <laughs> one of the uh, one of the meals was at a pub near there. They took us two in the car, and and the landlord knew that he wouldn't want anything else. But for some reason, maybe there'd been a, a problem in the kitchen. But it, when this plate came to him, it had a, a fried egg on it as well as the sausage and chips, and he was he was not happy. I can tell you, <laughs> it, was, it was just straight. Because the funny thing about Gary is, I mean, that sounds like he's a diva. He's really not. He's just mm. he's the most ordinary, down to earth, nice person you could ever hope to meet, especially for a living legend, who he, which he clearly is. Mm. Um, then a, a pioneer, and uh, but he's the most easy chap to talk to, and he's very um, he, he, he's not backwards coming forwards in offering very candid things. I mean, at the time when we were there, it was there'd been a long period of where they'd been unsuccessfully trying to have kids, him and Gemma, and mm. and I think that had caused them a them an awful lot of heartache because um, this would be in between the which albums was it the Exile and Pure mm. I think was. Um, so that was a hot topic, which they brought up quite a bit that day. But they're just really lovely people. I was ec I was really ecstatic when I heard that they uh, started ha having kids because yeah, you know, I knew yeah. it was a big deal for them. Um, the but yeah, so it was a great day, though. So how, what were you doing, Sarah, then? Did, did you have to record in a studio on your own somewhere? Yeah. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was as straightforward as that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's exciting when you get it when you when we first get to hear it and they're both on there yeah that, that's the moment isn't it when you just hear the two voices come linked together and it's just like oh it works oh my god yeah it had, it had been a real stipulation about us that um we wanted whatever's gary gary sung part would have to have the word you in it mm -hmm. because gary <laughs> gary really likes the word you you know and like um and you know, this he sings it totally. Oh, yo, it, only, it, it just it, it really seems to. So we were desperate to make sure that whatever the song was that he was going to do, the word "you" would be prominently featured at the end of the line. Yeah, and yeah. a bit like it. You need if you were doing it with Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, you'd have to have tonight, tonight in there, tonight. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's a pet word for him. 
where where is I mean what's happening with Dubstar now? Are, are you still working together? Are you doing things or? We are yes. We're uh, we're nearly or almost finished an album. Have you? Yes. Brilliant. Almost there. Yeah, yeah. we're very excited about it. And in actual fact, even though you, you wouldn't know it, I mean, Sarah and I have probably been working on music together now on a pretty much daily basis for for a long time, like years. But uh, years, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, I don't think we could stop if we wanted to. You know, it's like. Mm. Um, so when are you hoping that to come out? We don't know yet. We we'll just we we'll just see. Yeah, ho hopefully this year. Um, but we, it really does depend a lot on a lot of things. I think that the pandemic's um, has really shaken up the whole industry. Yeah. Just like it has it other time, industries. I mean, absolutely nothing, hasn't it? It's just. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and it's. Um, and it's, it's hard to know when a good time to release something is anymore, actually. <laughs> it is, and, and, and it's probably even harder trying to even think of doing anything live at, at this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, can't bear the disappointment of, like, booking something, yeah. book, you know, booking in a gig and then just having to cancel it all. And it's, you know, and, and, yeah. and it costs as well because we've got... You know, yeah. we, we we'd need other other people on stage with us, and it's rehear it's the t you know rehearsing them up, and then you know the expense of doing that, and then not being able to do the gig, and just having your expectations constantly dashed. It's just, do you know what? I'd rather just leave it, and then when things, if things get to normal, just do it then. You know? Yeah, I mean, un unlike the recording side of the music biz, the, the live side is utterly dependent on uh, insurance um, in yeah. order to function. Um, and I think with that, that safety net, it's just really hard to, to entertain the idea of the kind of outlay it takes to really do live properly. Mm -hmm. um, which is it's tragic, really, because especially when you have your big festivals like Glastonbury and things like that, too, which are, can't do it, then. you know, the outlay for that is in the millions. You just can't oh, yeah. <laughs> risk it, you know. So, but uh, you, I mean, whatever, whatever level you're at in, the, in music, it's, you know, we couldn't really justifiably afford to do a tour now you know what I mean it just so what is the on the new album what is the sound is it is it very distinctively yourselves or if you hopefully <laughs> well on this, on this album we've got um Stephen Higgs there uh, producing with us and um who did our first album and obviously he's best known for um Pet Shop Boys um and the likes so a new order so in some ways um it does feel a little bit like a, a return to the more electronic sort of side of things um but you know not 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 100 percent um it's it's a mixed bag mm. for the, the new album it's got lots of interesting things on it but i don't i think people who like the group will be pleased because it for me it feels like it's the strongest thing we've done but everybody says that though don't they you know well um, you, you could be right you but, never know uh, uh, and that's the main thing so um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember one of the last times I saw him. It was it was quite a long time ago. I remember it was when the Sugar Babes had their um, yeah number one hit that week was that week uh, with their Freak Like Me thing, which was obviously a mashup of our friends Electric. And he was so excited about it, and he said it's like it's so, it's so much better than my song. <laughs> you know? oh, like, but um, but yeah, he you know, still does he still says it? <laughs> does it? Yeah, well, I can believe it because he just he was just so excited about it. But at the time, it was at backstage at Shadows Bridge Empire, and he. He'd just done a gig and it was he was having a bit of a flashpoint there in terms of popularity because it was a massive and huge like mm. really rapturous gig i mean you always, it's always a surprising when you see him live just how ecstatic it gets oh yeah oh you know? the crowd are wonderful the yeah. new one new yeah. <laughs> I, I actually heard that at a craft work gig i'm in mean, brixton once <laughs> so really He's waiting for Craftwork to come on. You could hear Newman. Oh, that's <laughs> so cool. That's so well, he, cool. No, I mean, he's a fascinating guy. And, and I, I'll never forget the first time I saw him on the telly was when he was on Top of the Pops um, in yeah. 1978. And um, and because it, it, it just be, shortly before that, I'd, there was a girl called Joanne used to live next door to my mum and dad. And she took me into her cellar of her house and, and kissed me on the face. And I ran home and put myself to bed so I could think about what had happened. <laughs> and late, late, later that year, just a bit later, it was Gary was on top of the pops doing Our Friends Electric. Mm. And it was so completely different. <laughs> To anything that, because I used to watch that show religiously, yeah, you know, we weekly, did. like oh, we yeah, all did. Yeah. And that I ran down the bottom of the garden and stood looking at the bricks on the wall, just thinking about what I'd just seen for like mm. about an hour because it was so affecting. It was, 
Um, I think I think seventy eight was a big year for me because I was probably six or something then, you know. Hmm. But but it's funny those things like just get burned onto your brain. Yeah. Um, and because uh, the thing about him is, you know, this is like you know the the punk thing had kind of done its dark, hmm. and you know, the embers were still glowing, but it was kind of finished. But that was so much of that was like was phony you know passion and excitement and yeah. his performance was so seemed to be kind of bridled it's almost like he was trying to stop, keep it in yeah and which was really unusual sight you know because you can see it's not dispassionate you can see he really cares about the music mm. and he's very into it but he's kind of trying to keep himself under control and that was so much more exciting and actually seemed more dynamic than watching shiwadi wadi you know in their <laughs> you know yeah, that series, I mean or like you know the other new wave bands even throwing themselves around you know well i never really could categorize gary you know he yeah. he, he, he wasn't part of the new romantic thing um yeah. but then i don't know if the whom league were so I, there was some sort of but I, I could never put him in a label yeah because he he wasn't completely simmed he had guitars bass yeah. drums yeah, yeah. You know, Human League had nothing, it was just Sims, so I, I never knew where to put him myself. I mean, the, the nearest thing, I, I suppose if you take like the first two, two Way Army album, which is about a year, a, well, yeah, pretty much a year before Joy Division's uh, Unknown Pleasures, for instance, mm. but you've got a similar thing going on. You've got like post punk guitars. Yeah, and doing those kind of like my Sharona type uh, yeah. rhythms and stuff with like suggestions of synth things which give it like a flavor and like for instance on the first two way on the album it's not really a dominant thing no, um, no. but it but it gives it provides a mood and an ambience which you mm. wouldn't normally get with that kind of a band by the time you, you know you've got your replicas album after that and suddenly you've got this he's, he's brought the the sense very much not, not, you know, as front and centre yeah. as the vocal, but really competing with his own voice with the big sweeping portamentos and things, which was really, it's really striking and unusual to hear at the time. It was just, it, it was like from a different planet, you know. Indeed, and I always thought that, and something like Down in the Park, the thing, yeah, yeah. basically, I mean, he was criticised and still is that he can't play sims or keyboards or whatever, but unless someone else was there, it was him doing the lot, wasn't it? Oh well, yeah. I mean, yeah. to me, he, he plays like a he, he plays since like a guitar player to me. It sounds mm. like because a lot of the choice of the notes, the do 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 do, it's mm. like hammering on things that you do in rudimentary guitar chords. You can hear that he's been a guitarist yeah. who's gone to a synth, mm. but those are very satisfying pa passages. That's why those are popular with guitars as well, you know. But it's, it's anyway. I could talk all day about it. You <laughs> really <laughs> sort of thought. But uh, anyway, it's, but it's been a, a pleasure to chat to you about it all. <laughs> yes, at last. We, we, we got there in the end. <laughs> yeah. But it's been brilliant to talk to you. And I, I'm the same. I, I could discuss Gary all day long. Um, mm. in, in fact, I, I do have a Facebook page and there's a bit of an argument going on about um, Gary miming and things like this. And I think, well, it's fine to have a debate about things, but you don't have to be nasty about things, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's... I've seen him live loads. I don't oh, know. So I. I think they were talking about his live stream the other night. Um, I oh, I didn't had... see that. Yeah, I, I haven't haven't seen watched it. That. Yeah. But, um... I think the thing with the live, live stream is that maybe it's just so, um, it's not stable. So, no, because um... he, he, he recorded it about three weeks ago. Right. So it was then... I, it wasn't live, live. Oh, was, I see. But I think as long as it's as live, I think that's, yeah. you know, I mean, God. I know. Know. But, <laughs> so, I mean, the, the danger with those sort of situations, though, is that if, you, if you've got time to look at it before it goes out, then you, if there's something you really don't like, you have the opportunity to, to change it. And, so, and why, why, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> most, of, most of the live albums you've ever heard from the sort of 70s and 80s and stuff were, like, had overdubs on. You know? Yeah. You know, they, if you listen to like U2's Rat and Home and stuff like that, there's loads of overdubs on that. You know, it's like because if you if you if you if you want to do a good job, you can hear why it could be better, and it's irresistible. You know. Well, exactly. I I I know. You know when, like, um, I suppose orchestral maneuvers done it right, maybe by having a tape recorder right in front of for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Full disclosure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> live bands do it all the time, and I I. Why wouldn't you? You know, if you can. Well, yeah, if you if you run in <laughs> if you run in sequences, anyways, you know what I mean. It's not, it's not. You know what I mean. It's there's nobody. Anyway, it's it. it you could, again, you could, you could talk about it forever. But, um, you could, you could. 
But that's brilliant, guys. Thanks ever so much for joining me today. I really, really do appreciate it. And all the best for the new album. I'll make sure um, I should be coming to a gig next year if you're doing them. Bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.